Everyone on Zoom. Um, yep, so my name is Richard Carr. I'm also one of Dr. Laura Wilson's uh, grad students over at Fort Hayes State University in Kansas. And then, um, as you said, I'm also the assistant curator at the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum in Malta. We're about to kick off a, hopefully a pretty fun summer of marine stuff this year. Um, so yeah, my talk, I work on mosasaurs. That's what my thesis is in Kansas. Um, and uh, as you know by now, <laughs> that's what the uh, today's presentation is gonna be on. So we'll define cranial kinesis, right? What is that? Uh, cranial kinesis is essentially when you have an element or elements that are, you know, they're in motion, they're moving in relation to a static and otherwise unmoving um, part of the skull. So we've got a couple um, really cool examples up here. Um, while I love mosasaurs, fish are my true calling. Um, on the far right of the screen there, that is the uh, sling jaw wrasse, and fish by far in the animal kingdom have the most kinetic skulls. And there you can see its jaws are shooting out of its face, right? And the brain case is staying right where it's supposed to be. But then the jaws are like way off in front of it and stuff, sucking up a little goldfish or whatever. Um, in the middle there, that cute little yawning rattlesnake um, is showing a bunch of different types of cranial kinesis. Um, so as you can see, you know, the lower jaws, they're not actually fused together. They're totally free of one another. They can kind of bend, do whatever the hell they want. And um, you can see the top of the skull, um, you know, if you look past the giant swinging fangs and stuff, you can see that the top of the skull there is also bending at a lot of really cool different angles and stuff. And can also, uh, left to right, can, can move around a bit as well. And so there's, again, lots of different types of cranial kinesis all happening at the same time, basically, um, in that example. And then I'm not much of a bird person, but on the right there, um, that is an American woodcock. And a lot of people think that their beaks, you know, are super hard and rigid. Um, but it turns out birds have cranial kinesis too. This is an, a type called rhynchokinesis, so they can kind of like uh, bend little things around to help them pry open um, and forage for food. So, but we're, we're focusing on, on mosasaurs, right? So um, this is just a simplified diagram of a mosasaur skull, kind of highlighting the different uh, functional units in a mosasaur skull. This is uh, a figure modified from LeBlanc et al. Uh, 2013. They were describing some cool stuff in Plotosaurus' uh, skull. I'll be focusing on these um, three little areas. The mesokinetic axis is that first one uh, in the middle of the skull by the brain case. That is the metakinetic um, joint there. And then at the back, that is the uh, simplified quadrate and the streptostylic joints. Uh, so I'll define those all really quick. Mesokinesis is essentially, meso means middle, um, it's basically this joint kind of going across the middle of the skull. Um, in mosasaurs specifically, it's basically where the prefrontal uh, meets the frontal and then the post-orbital frontal, and motion along that kind of axis is what raises and lowers that muzzle unit, so where you have both maxillae and the premaxillae. Uh, next, you have the metakinetic joint, and so the metakinetic joint is towards the back of the skull, the parietal, which is that big kind of flat piece at the back and the top of the skull, and how that sits on top of and uh, contacts in multiple places the brain case, and that can sort of uh, raise and lower the back of the skull. And then lastly, we have streptostyle, um, and this is where the quadrant can sort of help swing the jaws forward and backwards, um, not necessarily increasing the gape that much, but sort of uh, moving, moving everything around, right? And in snakes, one of the relatives of uh, mosasaurs, you can do, almost, like we saw with the rattlesnake, you can um, incorporate almost all of these different cranial kinetic regimes simultaneously, and that's how um, you get snakes kind of like walking food down their throats, right? That's uh, a type of feeding called ratchet feeding, and, you know, you know, since early on in mosasaur paleontology, um, scientists have kind of, you know, have always understood, or just about always understood anyways, that mosasaurs are very closely related to both lizards and snakes, and uh, have thought, okay, mosasaurs have uh, some sort of capability. So the rest of them, you do, you have a uh, personal statement. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Somebody oh, sorry. <laughs> anyways, my, my bad. Um, <laughs> So basically, uh, lots of scientists and stuff from time immemorial with, um, in the study of uh, Moses or paleontology have noted the um similarity in the elements in the skull of Mosasaurus, and then also, um, you know, the, the possibility anyways of uh, kin kinesis in Mosasaurus and how that relates to other squamates. So a brief look at the history of <clears throat> uh, the study of cranial kinesis, you know, it's not there's not a very um, expansive literature record. On the right there, that's a modified figure from Sam Williston. He's one of the uh, first true North American Mosasaur paleontologists. Um, he did a really cool volume in like 1890 something um, where he started to sort of map out lots of different soft tissues. And in this case, it's sort of the muscle attachment uh, areas and stuff on the skull. This is uh, specifically the back of the skull of Clydastes. 
And so um, Williston kind of puts that out there. And uh, again, he's doing a lot of comparative, early comparative anatomy between mosasaurs, snakes, and lizards. Um, and then there's sort of this like 50 year hiatus where nobody really talks about mosasaur craniopenesis. And then the 60s roll around, and I don't know if it was the drugs or what, but then everyone's like, yeah, let's go back to craniokinesis. Let's, let's look at that now. And um, so there's this is from a cool figure from uh, Frazetta 1962, where basically um, they're trying to calculate all the different sort of forces necessary to move these different elements and how they interact with one another. Um, and that was in squamates in general, right? So lizards, mosasaurs, and snakes. Um, but there were a couple of other studies later on in the decade uh, that focused more specifically on mosasaurs. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to the late 1990s, and there's these two sort of opposing groups of authors um, that are trying to use the crania, uh, sorry, the kinetic abilities in the cranium of mosasaurs to sort of establish and, and hopefully uh, clear up the relationships of mosasaurs and whether they're closer to lizards or closer to snakes. And one group said uh, mosasaurs have this sort of intermediate cranial kinetic abilities, um, you know, so more than, more than lizards, less than snakes. Uh, and then another set of authors said, while that's true, they're sort of secondary, that the kinesis um, that we see in mosasaurs is secondarily evolved, it's convergently evolved, the elements are still more like lizards, uh, not really like snakes and stuff, and so the, the moral of the story is cranial kinesis is not necessarily uh, the best proxy for phylogenetic relationships. Um, now, fast forward to the 21st century, uh, we'll actually go back to Nathan Mortis uh, Statmani that Josh Lively um, just described last year, and you can see that, um, this is a picture of the brain case on the left there, that the parietal is really solidly contacting uh, the rest of the brain case, both the tops and the sides of it. Um, and that would have sort of completely prevented metakinesis, so movement in the back of the skull by the brain case. On the right there, that is um, from the description of Pleoplaticarpus picensis, one of my favorite mosasaurs uh, from around the, the area where I work in uh, Montana. And you can see that the quadrate at the back there, um, Q, that little like kind of question mark shape bone, um, it's sort of locked forward forward in this kind of anteriorly inclined position. And that would have prevented streptocytes. So these guys probably weren't swinging their jaws around. And the point of all this is basically to say that as, um, you know, mosasaur paleontologists are becoming, uh, you know, <laughs> more and more educated and stuff, and we're more familiar with the anatomy and everything, uh, more detailed descriptions, we're actually sort of realizing that um, in many cases, lots of mosasaurs don't really have that kinetic of skulls. And so I decided for this study anyways, um, that, hey, why don't we sort of compile all this data? It was mostly a literature review uh, to try and map out the phylogenetic placement of these different uh, cranial kinetic regimes in mosasaurs. Now, I didn't make this phylogenetic tree. Um, this is modified from Samoa's et al. 2017. And thankfully, um, Josh just did the lead work of sort of describing what all the different subfamilies of mosasaurs are. For the purpose of my talk, all you really need to know is that the basal mosasauroids, so things like Agiallosaurs, Dilichosaurs, these are like the modern lizards that we just throw in the ocean and, you know, lead to their own devices and stuff. Those are up at the top there. And then everything else is like, those are true mosasaurs, things like Mosasaurus, Clydastes, Tylosaurus, Etc. And uh, so what we see, the um, it's sort of a light green color there and stuff, those are um, in each cranial kinetic regime, those are sort of, uh, if that cranial kinesis is possible um, in those different uh, species, and then the red is sort of unlikely. Um, and so sort of take the streptostyle one with a grain of salt because there's definitely a lot of soft tissue involved in streptostyle between uh, muscle attachments as well as like cartilaginous uh, pads and things in the brain case and the mandibles uh, that make that a really hard one to um, sort of evaluate. But for the most part, you know, it seems that true mosasaurs typically don't have that kinetic of skulls. Um, and so again, these main phylogenetic uh, points uh, that are significant with this mapping project uh, was essentially that the basal ones, the Agiallosaurs and Dilichosaurs that are sort of the ancestors of these Mosasaurs do seem to have a kinetic ability in their skulls and that that might represent a sort of basal condition what those ancestors had. Um, but then again, later in the uh, geologically younger and more uh, morphologically derived Mosasaurs, they start to lose those um, kinetic abilities. That being said, the Mosasaurs, the true mosasaurs that do retain the cranial kinetic abilities um, likely represent ecological uh, specialists. And so uh, I decided to take a look at another aspect of um, possible kinesis in mosasaur skulls. And let's take a, um, a closer look at the mandibles, right? So all mosasaurs have this kind of crack going between their jaws um, that separate the front dentigerous portion with all the teeth and then the back half, right? 
And um, I did this really super high tech uh, analysis where I would take splenial and angular uh, elements that were sort of isolated and everything. And I just kind of play with them and see how they fit together. There was no math involved. Um, so again, take this with uh, a lot of salt, lots of grains of salt here. Um, and basically, I, had, I worked with what I had access to. Again, this is at the Sternberg Collection in Kansas. Uh, so we did the, the big three. We had Clydaces, um, Platycarpus, and Tylosaurus. And essentially, uh, we were trying. I was trying to take a look at um, the range of motion in the at that intermandibular joint in these three taxa. So to sort of illustrate this, right, you can actually use your arms. If you put your clasp your hands together, um, that sort of represents the symphysis where the two jaws meet, and then uh, your shoulders are where the quadrates would be, and then your elbows are essentially where uh, the intermandibular joint is. And so in Tylosaurus, right, this this is the largest of all these different species. Um, they have this really stiff. Uh, kind of joint. Usually it's kind of a ball and socket thing, but there's a lot of little flanges on the edges of it that totally prevents that from moving. So when they're, if you can imagine my arms are like the lower jaws, it's sort of like doing the funky monkey. It's just, as they eat, there's just <laughs> nothing happening. It's just all kind of stiff, right? It's braced. Clydastes, there's a little bit of dorsoventral flexion. Not a whole lot, not as much as I'm doing with my arms here and stuff, but there's some dorsal ventral flexion. And then in platycarpus, there's sort of uh, in the opposite direction, there's sort of this lateral bowing. They kind of go um, to side to side and it can kind of bend outwards a little bit, which shortens technically their oral cavity, but at the same time also widens it. And so again, I think that that has to do with um, ecological adaptations. Tylosaurus is this macroraptorial species that is, you know, not eating anything it can fit in its mouth. It's like slamming into a giant fish and other marine reptiles and stuff and just eating whatever the hell it wants. Uh, but then Platycarpus and Clydastes, they're a little bit smaller and they're likely more uh, specialized for feeding on small fish and cephalopods. And so there's a possibility anyways that the um, motion in that lower jaw is actually leaning towards an adaptation of suction feed. Now, suction feeding is not the same as filter feeding. You know, I'm not saying Mosasaurus had big lean and giant tongues and that kind of stuff, but suction feeding itself is actually a lot more commonly distributed in marine vertebrates um, and, and even marine tetrapods uh, than we think. Just about all species of like dolphins and porpoises and sea lions and seals and sea turtles and stuff uh, incorporate some form of suction feeding. Now, I'm not saying they're like a vacuum and like it sucks something into their mouth from across the room, um, but there is, you know, without hands, it's a handy way to sort of uh, process and acquire food in a viscous medium like water. And so typically speaking, how um, marine mammals and turtles, this is a freshwater matamata, mata, how they um, do suction feeding is they kind of rely on depression of um, the hyoids and stuff. So these kind of bones and cartilaginous rods in their throats uh, that sort of expand kind of the, the volume in their throat that generates negative pressure, which then sucks uh, food into their mouth. Fish, on the other hand, they rely more on actually move, they do do a little bit in the gill region and stuff. Um, but a lot of uh, how they do suction feeding involves sort of sucking up and moving their uh, mandibular elements, their mouth parts around. And so that's kind of more of what we're seeing in Mosasaurs. Again, this lots of grains of salt, folks. Um, we don't have many Mosasaur hyoids. So it's sort of hard to say if um, Mosasaurs might've been doing a combination of hyoidal suction as well as mandibular stuff or vice versa, who knows. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, um, it seems that in these kind of smaller Mosasaurs, Cladaces, Platycarpus, they might've been almost feeding in a fish-like fashion, uh, kind of drawing food um, down their gullet. Now, there are technically even more cranial kinetic regimes. Those three that I've mentioned, uh, mesokinesis, metakinesis, and streptostyle, are most commonly talked about um, in relation to squamates, the snakes and lizards, uh, and mosasaurs. But there are also, there's prokinesis, which um, is pretty well studied in birds, and specifically parrots there, like that diagram, where it's kind of like mesokinesis, right? The muzzle unit um, is moving around, but it's specifically the anterior half of that muzzle unit. Um, how useful that would be, even for possible possible suction feeders. Um, I don't really know. I personally don't think it's that uh, prevalent in mosasaurs, uh, but it's worth looking into. You know, some mosasaurs have this really interesting, very smooth kind of um, suture between the prefrontal and the uh, maxillary lamina for that prefrontal, um, and so it's not a very hard suture, and who knows if there's like a little cartilaginous uh, uh, connection there. Um, and then also there's palatal kinesis, right? So mosasaurs, like snakes, are famous for having um, teeth on the roof of their mouth, on their pterygoids. And we see not only in snakes, but even in lizards, this is a, a gecko skull, um, that there is a, a degree of motion in the palate uh, elements and stuff. So whether you're looking at the palatine, the bomer, uh, the pterygoids and stuff, um, 
a combination of both muscular movement of those elements, as well as if you're flexing the rest of your skull, right, whether it is just the brain case or the frontal, whatever, um, there's, that is still applying pressure and stresses to those palatal elements as well. And so it's definitely something worth, use, uh, worth looking into, um, again, because mosasaurs have those pterygoid teeth, and what the hell were they using them for if they're not you know, moving them around a little bit, you know. Um, and so some of the best ways to evaluate um, more, much more rigorously than me just playing around with bones, um, is kind of doing more digitization, um, biomechanical modeling. So taking things like CT scans or even uh, 3D surface scans, photogrammetric models, that kind of stuff, and um, doing biomechanical modeling, um, taking finite element analysis, FEA studies, to sort of map out where the stresses are in the skulls of these mosasaurs. Are there uh, weak points? Are there strong points? You know, Know, or do they kind of line up with what we traditionally um, uh, think of as these uh, metakinetic and mesokinetic and cranial kinetic uh, sutures and stuff? And then lastly, just good old fashioned comparative anatomy, you know, looking at the, um, the closest living relatives of mosasaurs, snakes and, um, and lizards, it's definitely nice that we still have some sort of model organism, um, you know, to sort of compare to. Um, well, and then lastly, <laughs> the, uh, the little <laughs> ichthyosaur fact, um, a quick survey of the literature didn't really come up with much. <laughs> uh, I have no idea how kinetic um, ichthyosaur skulls are. For the most part, I think they're pretty well braced. Um, but that being said, uh, a, a neat little tie-in between ichthyosaurs and mosasaur paleontology is recent work on the salt glands of ichthyosaurs will likely, I think, play a, a pretty important role in helping decipher the physiological abilities and placement of salt glands in things like mosasaurs, which at the moment, I think has only maybe like one or two papers that discuss that. So. I think these stories are cool. Not as cool as Mosasaurus, but they're cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for coming out to the talk, and I think we have lots of time for questions. <laughs>